Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Team Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) You sound like someone who's taking voice lessons. Hello, Hello, David, and welcome to all of our listeners. This is the Feeling Good podcast, episode 350. And this is something we've never done before. Yes, absolutely. It'll be a kind of an kind of a, an adventure for all of us. We're inviting you to become flies on the wall. And I hope you enjoy it. Flies on the wall to what? What's the wall? <laughs> oh, I forgot to say what. <laughs> to to the Tuesday group <laughs> at Stanford. And uh-huh. we're having a I've created a so-called master class in perfectionism to make it seem more important than it is. And there's part one and part two. So uh, today you're going to hear part one and you're actually going to hear the, the, my teaching with Rhonda and Jill Levitt and, and all the people uh, about perfectionism. And between this podcast and next podcast, you're going to learn four powerful techniques for dealing with perfectionism. I might say that we individualize the treatment for each person that we don't generally work with formulas, but this is a bit of a formula because there's four techniques that are almost always the first four you use whenever trying to overcome or or change the self-defeating belief. And in the show notes, I'll put a list of 23 common self-defeating beliefs, but three of the most common ones are perfectionism. That's the idea. I should always try to be perfect. Perceived perfectionism, that, that's where you think others want me to be perfect in order to like and love me. I've got to impress everybody. And then perfectionism nearly always goes hand in hand with the achievement addiction that my worth as a human being depends on my achievements. But there's what you're going to learn, the techniques you can use for you know a wide variety of those 23 self-defeating beliefs like you know submissiveness and entitlement and uh, love addiction and approval addiction and on and on and on. Now, the four techniques, we're going to highlight two of them this week and two of them next week. The two that we'll highlight this week are the cost-benefit analysis, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of trying to be perfect, because there's tons of advantages and tons of disadvantages and the patient has got to become aware of all of those, some are conscious, some are subconscious, and make a decision if they want to give up their perfectionism because they may and may not want to do that. And if they don't want to do it, then you can help them with with something else. We're not trying to impose some correct value system on the universe or, or our patients. If the patient decides, or if you doing these exercise sizes d- decide, that the disadvantages of perfectionism are greater than the advantages, then the second technique is called the semantic technique. And that's where you reward the belief so as to get rid of all of the disadvantages and maintain the advantages. It's kind of like having your cake and eating it too. Um, And so when we, and in the Tuesday group, we're going to, we have a small group experiences and small group big and small group experiences in the big group, which is you'll, you, what you'll be hearing recorded. We're teaching, we're doing demonstrations, we're doing a Q, Q&A and that, and, and that type of thing. Now, we didn't record the small groups. We will next week. So you can actually be a, a fly on the wall in, in the small groups. But in the small groups, the uh, our, our students practice the, these methods. And when we come to the small group, my recommendation is to you folks, and I'll, I'll put this, the tools you need 
in in the uh, uh, show notes, or you can just uh, Google, you know, cost benefit analysis, and then you'll you'll come to one on my website, a blank one that you can download and use. But I would say to do the small group exercises this this week while we're doing them, you should do them. Whether you're a therapist or a general citizen, uh, the, 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 these are are really uh, kind of fun and helpful and eye opening exercises. You will enjoy. Uh, and is there anything else I need to say here, uh, Rhonda, before no. we turn on the recording and dive no. in? No, I think okay. it's pretty clear who's talking and some people's fo- the quality of their audio isn't quite as good as others, maybe quite because of where their microphone is. But I think in general, the quality of the sound is is good enough so that you can enjoy the podcast throughout. Yeah, and the, and you, you'll be in, in a class with about 45 other people. Uh, uh, exclusively mental health professionals who were trying to learn tools to improve their personal lives, but especially their their clinical skills. So, uh, and then also let us know if you like this format and, uh, uh, you know, want want more of it or prefer the the traditional format for our podcast, which has worked re- really well. But this experiment giving you something something new. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And so before we sign off, there's one last super (laughs) important message that Rhonda will now deliver. We you know, in the Tuesday group, you give a you and Jill explain what you're doing very clearly, and then you're gonna hear people you know, respond to your questions and, and like you asked people to come up with a list of all the advantages and disadvantages of perfectionism. And you'll hear various people give you their, their definitions and their reasons. And, you know, you can add to your, you know, while you're thinking about, while you're listening, you can think to yourself, what's a really good advantage to my own perfectionism or what's a disadvantages to my perfectionism as, as if you're in the class and then it could be really fun. Yeah. And in the class, we came up with uh, 18 advantages of perfectionism and 24 disadvantages. And uh, so there's it, it. I think you'll find it very interesting. Yeah. OK, well, enjoy. OK. Tonight, we're going to be looking at perfectionism and next week as well. And this is probably one of the most popular topics in all of psychology and psychotherapy uh, not only something that a lot of our patients struggle with is perfectionism and, and self-criticism, but uh, I think an awful lot of us do as well. So just to kick things off, um, let's talk uh, about a couple of g- general issues, and then we'll get into specific uh, techniques. But what is perfectionism? How, how would you define it? And uh, this is just open for anyone who has an idea you want to share with the group. So we'll kind of know what we're talking about. Well, I can tell you that, uh, oh, there we go, Amy. I was afraid that I was going to have to say perfectionism is the fear of making mistakes. And since no hands have gone up, <laughs> sounds like we got a lot of perfectionists in the room. But uh, uh, yeah, Amy. Um, so the definition that I wrote down for myself is that it's the belief that one's worth is dependent on one's performance. Okay, and, kind of kind of like the achievement addiction. That's good. And also that mistakes are evidence that something's wrong with you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. I love that. Uh, you know, worth equals my performance and mistakes mean... Um, there's uh, something wrong with you. Mistakes are bad. Uh, that's terrific. I love those. Any other ideas? Let's see here. We've got Jill Kelly. What's your idea, Jill? Um, well, this was just before I looked up the definition, but um, kind of just my notes. I was um, achievement of doing something with excellence in understanding and looks with complete certainty, absolute correctness, no complaints from myself or from others. So absolute cor- correctness is uh, kind of a phrase I picked up there. Is that right? 
Uh, yes. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, that, that's a good one. Uh, uh, Re- Regina, the creator on the spot of new techniques. Right. Thank you. Uh, so I said perfectionism is someone who must get it and do it right. They can't make a mistake. Yep. Must do it. Must do it right. Uh, uh, cannot make a mistake. Yep. That's a great one. Uh, I love it. Very clear. Uh, a- any other ideas about, uh, let's see, any other hands gone up here on definitions of perfectionism? Well, I think the ones that we have so far, oh, yes, uh, Karen. Sure. It's a little repetitive, but I wrote something flawless and no mistakes or oddness are allowed. Yeah, uh, flawless, no mistakes or what? Oddness. Yeah, like yeah. It's odd. Uh-huh. Yeah, or oddness uh, is allowed. Yep. Um Great. Uh, Those were all wonderful definitions of perfectionism, and they put some meat on the bone so what we know what we're dealing with right now. How many of you uh, would uh, see yourself as as a perfectionist, given one of those definitions we just heard? Just put your hands up if you're in that perfectionism zone. So that I see... Every hand except for Orly and Ed. No, Ed is with us too. Uh, almost that, that's a good ninety percent uh, turnout. So we'll see kind of if we want to do something about it and what we can do about it. I'm going to turn the second question over to to Jill to lead on definition the difference between perfectionism and the healthy pursuit of excellence. Um, and Ganesh, did you want to say something? I was saying that I definitely uh, go to a lot of perfectionists. It always paralyzes me. Mm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, yeah, the next question David had queued up is, what what are the differences between perfectionism, as we've just defined it, and the healthy pursuit of excellence? So what are your thoughts about that? Regina, I see that your hand is up. Or maybe it was just up from before. Yeah, well, it was up from before, but I can speak to that. Uh, Could you repeat it for me again, Jill? Sure, yeah. So what's the difference between perfectionism and the healthy pursuit of excellence? I think the difference would be is is that the perfectionist person is really based on they can't make a mistake, right? Um, But when you think about the excellence of it, I guess the good thing of it is that they do work towards excellent, but it would be it would be less about them and more about the accomplishment. So you're saying that um, in both cases, you might be working toward excellence, but in the case of the healthy pursuit of excellence, you're working more toward the thing and it's less about like how that reflects on the person himself. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we could say like the ego is less wrapped up in it, right? One might be striving toward excellence, but not define their self-worth based on being excellent. Correct. That yeah. right? Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense to me. And Carly, I see your hand up. Yeah, I think um, the difference to me is kind of like a healthy pursuit of excellence is like wanting mm-hmm. something for yourself and working towards it. and um, you know, working towards excellence, um, but also being okay with failure and even growing from failure. Whereas perfectionism, I think there is a tie to like your worthiness as a human being um, and making mistakes, meaning that you're a failure and there's something wrong with you. Okay, great. It yeah. almost sounds like the wanting versus needing or something, right? Yeah, like we've talked about that before, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. And then um, Jason, did you have something to add? Oh, yes. I thought um, for some reason it seemed easier to define than actually perfectionism itself. But I was feeling that um, the perfectionism is like when you're never satisfied, no, almost never satisfied. And so you're always kind of like beating up on yourself and you generally kind of aren't happy and content regardless of what you do, because there could always be something that could be done better. Mm-hmm. But the healthy pursuit of excellence is, or achievement is where you're kind of 
on the journey and you're appreciating the ups and downs and you know, failures or learning experiences and uh, you know, successful endeavors or things to appreciate where perfectionism, you're basically never giving yourself a break and you're just never happy or content. Yeah, that sounds really powerful. It's kind of a, an emotional way of looking at it, right? Like how you feel when you're a perfectionist. Let me interrupt just temp temporarily, because uh, Carlos, you had your hand up. I didn't know this would be your first night here in the group. So why don't you, we have a wonderful new member uh, who I knew was going to join us at some point, but here you are, Carlos. Oh, thanks a lot. I feel honored to be introduced to this beautiful group. I was going to say actually pretty something pretty similar to what others said. Uh, perfection in, in perfectionism, mistakes define your self-worth. Whereas in excellence, you're open to learning no matter how many mistakes you make. But I would like to make the comment that you have those mistakes should be in a way like you, you should hold yourself accountable for the mistakes you make. It's not just any mistake that you may wish to make, but it's something that you're aware of the consequences. So that's basically it. And I think that most people have said what I'm saying right now. Thanks so much. And then Orly, you had your hand up too. So I may be repeating what others said, but I think it has to do with exercising some realistic judgment about yourself. And uh, in healthy pursuit of excellence, you just pursue your talents, your desires, but you are able to, um, to be realistic about what you can and cannot, mm -hmm. um, as well as allow yourself to be inspired and also to forgive yourself to accept what you can and what you can't. Yeah, I'm super. Yeah, I love this. Thank you. We're going to give you a chance to participate. Let's say you're working with a patient and you've done a downward arrow technique to, do, to identify that patient's self-defeating beliefs and that perfectionism is one of those self-defeating beliefs, and that's one that the patient wants to work on. And I might say that... Um, Whoever spoke first, I can't remember now who it was, but has also uh, combined perfectionism with the kind of achievement addiction, which it nearly always goes hand in hand with, with which is my worthwhileness as a human being depends on my achievements. And plus, my achievements have to be fantastic or they're no good at all. And failure threatens my sense of identity, my self-esteem. Uh, it's uh, I'm trying to prove that I'm a worthwhile hu human being. That's kind of a essence uh, behind perfectionism. And so you always first want to recognize that the self-defeating beliefs, uh, you know, we you have that handout with 23 common self-defeating beliefs. So, you know, love addiction, achievement addiction, submissiveness, brush fire fallacy, and on. They're all two-edged swords. They're not Ellis called them uh, irrational beliefs, but that's like a put-down uh, type of thing. And uh, my idea is that the, these beliefs are two-edged swords. They have a healthy side uh, and, a, and an unhealthy side, and many of you have alluded to that already. And so before you can change a patient's self-defeating belief, you have to get permission to do so. And the big error in therapy is trying to help people thinking we know the answers and we know what's right. And so instead, uh, you can do either a, a triple paradox uh, on perfectionism. Uh, that's if somebody seems potentially super oppositional and determined to, to, to cling to their perfectionism, the very thing they want help with. But uh, a simple cost-benefit analysis uh, is an excellent way to deal with self-defeating beliefs, including perfectionism. And so your assignment in this first small group exercise is, as a group, make a list of all the advantages and benefits of being perfectionistic. And if you want, linking your self-esteem with your achievements as a human being and how productive you are. Um, and there's many ways that belief is going to help you and benefit you individually, interpersonally, uh, and in many ways. In addition, there will be some disadvantages, and you can, what's the downside of trying to be perfect, and what's the downside of linking your self-esteem 
with your achievements or intelligence or success or productivity. <clears throat> and then once you've listed all the advantages in the left-hand column and all the disadvantages in the right-hand column, and as you list them in the group, everyone's list will be a little different. Uh, and then uh, at the end, then weigh them against each other on a 100-point scale. For example, if they're 50-50, there's two circles at the bottom, put a 50 in each circle. If the advantages of perfectionism are greater than the disadvantages, put a larger number in the left-hand column and a smaller number in the right-hand column, like might be 65 advantages and 35 disadvantages. And if the disadvantages are greater, just the opposite, the larger number will be in the right-hand column. So it might be 1090 or 45, 55, where the disadvantages seem greater. And it's not how many are in each column, but how they feel to you, how you weigh them overall. And once you've done that, we can all come out at the same time. And then we'll have people from different groups, you know, share, you know, what the list that your group came up with and uh, and various people can say whether the advantages or disadvantages won the day. Uh, any additional tips for people, Jill, or anyone before we break up into small groups? No, and if you're sounds good. So we're going to do the kind of the CBA, but starting, you know, paradoxical, starting with the advantages and then moving on to the disadvantages rather than the triple paradox. We'll just all do the CBA. I think it's easier. I was yeah. thinking the, the triple paradox, but I think that it'll be very simple and rewarding to do yeah. a cost-benefit analysis. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I hope you all had a great small group. I can tell you that in our um, in our group, uh, it was very productive. We came up with uh, 14 advantages and 17 disadvantages, and the majority weighed the disadvantages greater, but uh, one person weighed the advantages of perfectionism greater, and one person started out as 50-50 and then migrated to where the disadvantages were greater. What advantages did you folks uh, c come up with? Let's just do a big uh, a group a, a note-taking here. So, Sean, do you want to share what we came up with or the ones that resonated for you? Yeah, just um, the on the positive side, more like the, you know, the attention to detail, accuracy, that kind of thing, um, having um, high standards, it may get, cause it like a strong work ethic, um, it can create strong motivation to do whatever, engage in whatever goal that you're trying to pursue, um, high quality work, um, uh, you know, helps you to prioritize. Um, that and just playing just to get stuff done. It can really be a strong motivator. Yeah. Okay, great. What are some other advantages? Um, so our group, with, in addition to what Sean shared, um, leadership, power, maybe perceived superiority and be perceived as someone who's smart were some of the advantages that we came up with. Uh, the power perceived what was it oh intelligence yeah that you perceive that you were smart leadership yeah. and superiority oh yeah superiority yeah yeah you project superiority because we wouldn't expect an average person to be perfectionistic or a below average person so when you say you expect yourself to be perfectionistic or to be perfect you're saying that you see yourself as really one cut above other people more intelligent more capable and stuff like that what are some other advantages that you came up with tell us carly i love it when you explain these things okay thanks david um some others that were not said already um it might help me get promoted more often more more um, money too yeah more money um helps me obtain approval from other people um, I'm a valued member of a team. That's um, good. It also shows humility because I'm able to see my flaws. Um, gives me a sense of control. I think those are all the ones that haven't been said yet. 
Cool. That helps me never be mediocre. Yeah. I think yeah. perfect, uh, protection from failure or shame is important too. Yep. Yeah. Protection from failure and shame. Sure. I was also thinking that it could be you know, perceived as attractive for other people. Like you might be perceived as being dependable. Um, like if you know someone's gonna babysit your kids, you might want to go with the perfectionist versus somebody yeah. else. Yeah, and people we, might admire that. Yeah, we have a member of our app team uh, who was really intelligent, wonderful f- fellow, warm and very deep. But he's very perfectionistic about his work, and I keep telling him, "Don't, don't let that go." <laughs> and he you know he works weekends and puts in extra time and does really brilliant wonderful work but right. at a considerable emotional cost because i think he's beating up on himself quite a bit and with that in mind what are some of the disadvantages uh, maybe from your group jill um okay orly do you want to share some of the disadvantages that we came up with yeah, I will start with the one that uh, related to me the most, and um, it interferes with relationship because um, I'm being judgmental of myself and others. Um, it's irritating to others. It is. Um, it could lead to compromised health. Um, it could lead to avoidance because it's not going to be perfect, so you might as well not even try. Um, doesn't allow you to enjoy um, your accomplishments because it's never good enough. Um, it's paralyzing. Uh, makes you feel guilty or bad about yourself. Just um, slow down a little because these are so fantastic. You can't enjoy yourself because you're never good enough. And then you gave two good ones right after that. Paralyzing. And tell us why it's paralyzing because that's key. Because you are not going to take the chance that it's not going to be perfect. Right. So, yeah. So it's paralyzing you. And, yeah. um, It makes you feel guilty, ashamed, or bad about yourself. Um, It's stressful and exhausting. Exactly. And how how do you feel when you fail if you're a perfectionist? There's no, that's why you, there's no point. Right. Uh, um, one advantage of perfectionism is how do you feel when you succeed? You have a big but, victory. But you never really succeed because nothing is good enough. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's a great disadvantage. Nothing is ever g- good enough. Uh, that, that, that's a great one. Any other disadvantages that you came up with, Orly? These are terrific. That's pretty much what we did. Good. Any other disadvantages from other groups? One we came up with is that um, you're probably not going to be open to criticism. You'll probably get real defensive when you're criticized. uh, And that inhibits your learning. And as you said earlier, Orly, it inhibits uh, personal relationships. Who else would like to read some uh, disadvantages your group came up with? Stacy's got her hand up, I see. Stacy. Hi. Um, We were talking about how it really can be boring. It can rob you of your spontaneity, right? Because you're so afraid to make a mistake that you can't be in the moment. Um, I love those. Diminishes your joy. You can end up feeling really lonely or separate yeah that we came up with that a lot in our group too because um i think you made yourself vulnerable in a group a couple weeks ago and then suddenly everyone felt super close to you and i think that is one of the great joys of our group is to be open and vulnerable and let people see our insecure 
side that then are the side of us that suffers and then the joy that comes from that kind of connection with others and that that's the kind of the loneliness of the long distance runner and the loneliness of the perfectionist uh, that you miss out on some of that and any others stacy um yeah that you can be so judgmental of yourself and of others yeah that's huge and it's kind of unrelenting leads to burnout yeah Um, I saw Karen Perlman's, and she was in my group. You can go ahead, Karen. Um, makes me over-focus on deficits. Um, maybe losing sight of other areas of strength. Those are great so far. Thank you. Um, may exude less confidence. Um, may overlook something important that the client was presenting. This was about a client for me. So I might overlook something important that they're presenting. Um, and maybe it takes the focus away from the client, um, impedes growth and enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the impedes growth is, I think, huge because uh, uh, I feel I fail so often. So I have a like a cornucopia of growth opportunities. But if you're afraid of failing, then you lose that tremendous uh, opportunity. Those are great. Any other uh, disadvantages from anyone in any group? So. First of all, you cannot forgive neither yourself nor other people. So it really goes with impedes growth because you're stuck and you could never let go. Those are great. Uh huh. Yeah, and, and it, it, it interferes similar to what you just said early with acceptance, uh, two forms of self acceptance and the self acceptance, uh, which is. A, a key to enlightenment and something that many people can't grasp that kind of acceptance don't really understand it fight against it and then also the ex the acceptance of other people which the world rails against the world wants to kick ass not accept people who are different want to judge and punish and hurt anyone who's who's different and uh so those are uh, that inability to accept yourself and others is another, and it blocks your your the road to enlightenment. Um, so any other big advantages or disadvantages anybody came up with? I don't know if we um, said this one yet for disadvantages, but I think the par paradoxical part of perfectionism, right, is that it shows that you're like a narcissist. Yeah, uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. So that, that would be a disadvantage, I take it. Uh, if, I think so. <laughs> yeah, it shows nar narcissism. <laughs> and then uh, Christine. Okay, it um, takes time away from your loved ones. Yeah. And it can sure. consume your brain. Yes. Now tell us why consuming your brain is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It is, but see if you can make, as a fourth grader, explain it to me as a fourth grader. Well, there's just so much more in life than just yeah. what you are all about. Yeah. There's a whole universe out there of others. Yeah. And a world, nature, yeah. and everything. It's just. Yeah, ab absolutely. It reminds me of uh, when my cat popcorn was alive he was my cat before obi and uh i used to go outside with popcorn in the backyard and he would just sit and stare at a bush so i would just sit there with him staring at the bush and i used to say to him popcorn you know this is as good as it gets so we better love this moment together and he understood what i mean and i used to tell him i said you know when one of us is going to die first and I don't know who, it's either be you or me, but I can tell you that if you die first, 
I'm never going to let you suffer. And I'll be with you at that moment. So you'll know how much I love you. And he did uh, a couple of years later die in my arms. He was purring. He could barely breathe. And uh, and you know he purred and then died in the middle of her purr. And you know it's just that's what cats or pets can teach a little bit, kind of like what you said, Christine. Uh, that the, or whoever said the thing about con- consuming your brain. Uh, yeah. That's for, so. So, um, how many of you now, uh, when you did your cost benefit analysis, found that the advantages uh, are greater than the disadvantages? Because I know we had put your hands up so we can see. So I can see uh, one person here. This has the advantages greater, and Diane, I see. And Stacy. Oh, Stacy, got it. Okay. Anyone else think that the advantages of perfectionism are greater than the disadvantages? So, so a few. Uh, and now, how many of you had a 50 50 deal go on there? Stacy is a half on that one. No, I'm sorry. I answered that incorrectly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I don't see any 50 50s. Might be in the other panel. Of- <laughs> I started off that way, David. It's Jill, 50 50, and then I kind of changed my score again, but I wanted to sit on the fence. <laughs> my <Sure>. my perfectionism. <laughs> I used to sit on the fence until I found out it was a picket fence, and so it kind of motivated me to move. But yes, great. And how many of you did the disadvantages outweigh the advantages? And I see, you know, a good, you know, 80 or 90, 90% uh, of you. Um, or maybe even more. Now, uh, before we move on to the next step, let me say, suppose you have a patient, or maybe we have some podcast listeners who who say that the advantage of my perfectionism are greater. What do you do next with that patient? What's the next step in in working on the perfectionism? Yeah, uh, Carlos. I don't know if I'm going to say something silly, but you sit with open hands and say, well, I, I can clearly see that the advantages outdo the disadvantages. So that means that you have no good reason to change. Yeah, that's absolutely. Maybe can I help you with something else? And that's right. that's the way to go. And because there's not a lot of mileage in trying to change people against their will and the perfectionism might be working for some people. And I've been perfectionistic at times in my life, and it's brought me a lot of benefits and hard work and things I was ended up feeling feeling pretty proud of. So that that's the route. Now, so the way to go when the advantage is greater, what, what would you say, folks, if it's 50-50? How would you help a patient who's 50-50? It seems you're on the fence. I don't know how to get anybody off the fence, but when you change your mind, just let me know. Or if you change your mind. Yeah, if you change your mind. Yeah, at any point, I'd always be happy to work with you, but that's also, let the patient persuade you. Don't try to chase after people, and, uh, you, you know, it's okay for people to be on the fence and to uh, sit with it. Now, if the disadvantage... Oh, can I have one other shot at yeah. Uh, yeah, I might say something like, um, it looks like there's a lot of good reasons or there's a lot of benefits and advantages of your perfectionism. And then it also looks like your perfectionism is, you know, costing you quite a bit as well. But given that these two things are equal and given that it would take a lot of work to change, it seems kind of taking all of that together that it would probably make sense not to work on this, right? Um, since both sides are about equal and on one side, if you wanted to be any different, you'd have to work really hard on it. So it seems like this isn't really something we should work on at this point. And then I'd say the same thing as Kai, if for any reason you changed your mind and at some point it felt like it was costing you more than it was benefiting you, of course, I'd be happy to work with you on it. Thank you, Jill, for, uh, as always, a tremendous uh, teaching point that is, is really appreciate. I, I appreciate, and I think everyone appreciates that. It's a nice way to communicate that to your patients. Um, now, if they, if the disadvantages are greater, then we can go to the next step in the change process, and this is a multi-step thing that we'll go over tonight and next week as well. Now, I see a question from Karen. 
Yeah, I was wondering in your experience, how much is enough? Um, I've been to some trainings where even the 60-40 was a bit of a borderline in getting enough traction to work through the resistance. I wonder if that's something you can speak to. Well, I'll give a quick answer to that. If you, and then we'll see what Jill has to say, or whoever has an answer. But whenever you're um, in, in doubt about somebody's motivation, or maybe they're just kind of shining you on a little bit or giving the weightings that they think they're supposed to give, you can always do external. Internalization of resistance, which, as you know, is a role playing exercise, and say, let's make sure that you really do want to give up your perfectionism, and I'm going to be the part of your brain that doesn't want to change, and uh, and I want to see if you can uh, defeat me. Um, now, one one thing uh, that we know is that your perfectionism gives you a strong work ethic, and because you work so hard, you've achieved a lot. And your achievement has brought uh, you a lot of recognition, a great, greater salary and uh, approval and admiration from other people. Why in the world would you want to give that up? And then you can see what they have to say. So again, you remain paradoxical and see if they can uh, persuade you that they do want to change. That would be kind of a, a an extremely easy to learn powerful backup procedure anytime you're in doubt about the patient's motivation. Thank you. Yeah. So the next step, uh, oh yeah, Car Carly. Yeah, I see your hand too. Oh, I was going to back off what you were saying, David, and I learned this from you that I typically wouldn't do necessarily do like a straightforward CBA for perfectionism. That's probably a paradoxical approach might be better right. for this um is that is yeah that right? that's right if you have someone who you think is going to be pretty oppositional at the start just list the advantages of perfectionism and then just say well why would you want to change and then if they don't want to change as i just say is there something else i can help you with great mm -hmm. questions now let's say that they would like to give up their perfectionism. Now the question is, how are they going to do that? Because all we have is the motivational step right now, but now we have to get the change step. And there's many, many additional steps actually that we can take. But the next one is always the semantic technique. And that means uh, if we're going to take away their perfectionism, we have to give them some something new to believe in, to substitute that I should always be perfect or my worth equals my achievements, give, give them some new belief to, to ha hang their hat on. And the new belief ha uh, should have two characteristics. It should uh, retain all, some, if not all, of the advantages of perfectionism, while at the same time minimizing or completely getting rid of the disadvantages. So we want to use the semantic technique means you just reword things. And again, the rewording is not to get change at the gut level. We, we still have powerful techniques to bring about change at the gut level. But this is still kind of a, a, an intellectual step. We've done a motivational step with the cost-benefit analysis or paradoxical cost-benefit analysis. But now there's an intellectual step is then what goal will you have? What value system will you have? Instead of telling yourself, I, I should never make mistakes, I should be perfect, my worth equals my achievement, what new value system will you give yourself? And I think we can do this at the small group level, but let me just say, you, say ahead of time, when you try to do that, with, uh, or your patients try to do that, they may come up with new beliefs that are equally problematic as the perfectionism, that have hidden traps w within them that you can kind of p point out to them. And they may have to, and you folks may have to try uh, two or three different uh, revisions of your perfectionism before you come up with a new goal, a new belief, a new value system that will really work for you to keep you motivated and enjoying your achievements, but without this long list of 10 or 15, or I think tw we came up with 23 disadvantages of perfectionism. Well, you're saying to your patient, I'd like to try a method with you that's called the semantic technique. And in this method, we're going to have you try to rephrase your belief 
Um, you're going to try to come up with a new belief that contains all of the advantages of your perfectionism. And you might list those, right? Something like a belief system that keeps you motivated and attending to detail and having high standards, but also gets rid of the disadvantages where you're not basing your self-esteem, you know, however you want to say it, right? That you're coming up with a new belief system or a new value system. And we're going to have you write that down. Beautiful, Jill. Thank you so much. I'm sure we got hundreds of thousands, if not more, mm -hmm. perfectionistic podcast listeners. You can right. uh, peek inside of uh, the Tuesday training group at, at Stanford. And thank you all in the Tuesday training group for allowing us uh, to, to, to do this as a podcast. So if it's good, we can kind of share the teaching, share, share the wealth of information with tre tremendous numbers of people t tonight and next week as well. Uh, absolutely. And then we'll have a kind of a fun uh, Q&A thing, and that'll bring us to the end of, of uh, part one on perfectionism. Great. Okay. So we're back in the big group, and so uh, tell us, folks, how your small group went. I can give a quick report on ours, which went well, but partly uh, Miriam was my co-leader and suggested practicing you know, how to bring the cost benefit to closure when what to say to the patient when the advantages outweighed the disadvantages. And it was, I, it was just something I thought, well, anyone can do that. But it was really hard for people to let go of the patient without, you know, hiding, getting in a hidden attempt to help them right, rather than just saying, sounds like the advantages of your perfectionism are greater. And probably this isn't something we should be working on right now because it's actually working for you. It's uh, it's not a problem. Uh, is there something else I can help you with? And so that's total sitting with open hands. And that was surprisingly d difficult, I think, because the fear of God went into some of our participants thinking, well, what if the patient doesn't want my help? That's terrible. And uh, so that, that was a very beneficial additional exercise. And then when we revised the... Uh, the perfectionism people came up with some uh, re really tremendous stuff. I thought uh, if everyone uh, knocked it out of the park to my way of thinking, did you come up for yourself or anyone, your group with a new belief to, uh, in place of the perfectionism? Uh, Stacy Clark. Uh, Carly made a couple of excellent points in our group, but one was that uh, often when you're doing this cost benefit analysis at the top of the sheet, is not the word perfectionism, but it's in fact a thought that you've derived from the person's daily mood journal. Sure. That is perfectionism, and that really loosened things up for me. And uh, I understood better that, in fact, this is all about language, as Carly said, and you want to take that perfectionistic thought and revise it so that it is it captures the advantages and decreases the disadvantages. But it's really, you're working with their original thought and trying to translate it into something that's more useful. Beautiful. Wait, can I just make one quick comment about yes. your thing? That, that we did get to examples as well, but that is also what we talked about in our group. So essentially, it wasn't like revise your perfectionistic belief. It was like, write down your perfectionistic belief. Leave, share it with the group like what is the actual belief we're working on and then come up with a revised belief and actually people had a little bit of a hard time with it we had to talk also about kind of the rules like the new belief has to actually you know like relate to the original belief like it you know if the original belief was something like um i uh i i have to know everything in order to do an excellent workshop the new belief had to have something to do with like you know, it's okay to not know everything or like I can still feel good about my work even when I don't know everything. And so we did have to talk a bunch about how to um, come up with specific belief, perfectionistic belief, and then also how to come up with kind of a new one that hangs on to the positives and get, gets rid of the negatives. It did seem like it was um, challenging for people to to do that exercise. Yes, absolutely. Can you give us uh, just an example? Uh, like, uh, instead of I have to know everything to do a good or to do a great workshop, what could I tell myself instead? Yeah, um, uh, it's important for me to prepare adequately, but it's impossible for me to know everything. Um, and I can still do a good workshop without knowing everything. Yeah, sure. Excellent. And I have one too. I had Lucy just sent me hers. And so let's see, hers was 
I must be better than I am now in order to be loved and approved. And the new belief was I can keep learning and growing as a therapist and human being, and I'm fine and okay just as I am now. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, great which examples. I like, right? Because yeah, yeah. again, it's this idea that like I can hold on to the positives, which is that I want to keep learning and growing, but get rid of the negatives and just accept myself as I am now. Yeah, I must be better yeah. than I am now uh, to be a, an adequate therapist. And then what's the re- you you gave a great revised version, but I didn't have time oh. to write it down, and I want to. Yeah. So yeah, the first, it was I must be better than I am now in order to be loved and approved. Okay. Like approved okay. Love. And the new belief was I can keep learning and growing as a therapist and human being. And I am fine and okay just as I am now. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Great. We're really getting into uh, uh, and, and, and the philosophy here. J- Jing, yeah. and thank you, Jill. Jing. Sure. And we had a really great group, and Kai is a great leader. Um, so I found it's more challenging than I thought with the figure out the new belief. Uh, Olivia had a really good question, and she was asking, so what if the patient just kind of give you this new belief for the sake of just, you know, let you to hear what you want to hear? So Kai was saying that it's better to do another cost benefit analysis with this new belief. I was just wondering like if you and Jill can give your wisdom. Like I, I felt like it's quite challenging and complicated for me. Like I felt like a little bit lost. I'll let you address that, Jill. I I think you just asked um if a patient comes up with a new belief and you think that they just did it to please you, what do you do? And I, in that case, I would just say, do you really believe this? Or are you just saying that to shut me up? You know, are you just saying that to, to make me smile? Um, or is this, you know, this looks like a great belief to me, but the important thing is that it, you know, that, it, that you believe it or that it makes sense to you. I love that. Mm-hmm. And also you can use changing the focus, which is one of the advanced communication techniques. If you think the patient is shining you on and isn't really believing what they're saying just say you know you're really smart and you're doing a great job and you came up with a new revised belief but i'm sensing a little bit of awkwardness between the two of us because i'm not convinced that you really believe this new thought or that you really want to change and maybe you're still a little bit on the fence can you tell me uh, if you sense that also and how you're experiencing this right now Anyone else, or I can give I can give you some examples from our group. Uh, and instead of uh, you know trying to be perfect, uh, Jill's modification was: uh, I can love learning, and I can continue to have high standards without beating up on myself. And I thought that was really nice. Maryam said, "I, I can uh, instead of uh, trying to be perfect, I can selectively." aim for excellence and i don't have to aim for excellence all the time or in anything Uh, you know sometimes just aiming to be average would be good enough Um, amber said i can continue holding on to the advantages uh the values in the advantages column and i can continue to work hard and but i can also take breaks as my body needs and remember to have fun and spend time with family and uh, the and value connections with other people as well um and diane uh, her perfectionism is on her progress notes and which she gets perfectionistic about and it becomes very procrastination and time consuming and oppressive and you're so simple and i thought pretty darn excellent. Uh, I can continue to pursue excellent excellence in various areas of my life, but not in the area of progress notes where average we will be pl- plenty, plenty good. And here was my own as, uh, revision. I can enjoy creativity, uh, and on occasion I can aim for excellence, but sometimes and probably a lot more often I can aim for being average. Uh, and 
I can always learn from my mistakes and failures, which are abundant. And I also gave the example that, uh, you know, I was perfect, really perfectionistic when I'm young, and it still hits me at times and hurts when it happens. But that, uh, you know, I kind of aim for mediocrity now in many areas of my life, like when I do the show notes for the podcasts. That's a big job. And so I just try to, did I tell you this already in the big group? Mm-mm. Uh, that I my goal in writing show notes is to write really crappy show notes, and that makes it super easy to whip off some show notes. And then I send it to the people who've been on the podcast, say, please edit this. This is just anti-perfectionistic, and it's a very rough, unedited draft. And, uh, you know, correct any errors you see, but edit things out, rewrite things, change things, make it any way you want. And then ninety. Uh, 90- percent of the time people just write back and say yeah these are really excellent I made a couple of typos but i love the way you do show notes it's amazing Mm -hmm. and so for me aiming for you know below average has vastly increased my productivity as well as the quality of my work uh, oddly Uh, regina no i just had a question dr Um, burns about um so would you recommend using the um self-defeating beliefs um, form that you have uh, that's broken down in perfectionism or perceived achievement, those various um, boxes. Yeah, those are real form. good. Yeah, that's an easy way for people to identify their self-defeating beliefs and the way they're worded. A lot of people can, ident- can identify with, and you can use those at the top of the cost-benefit analysis. So it's a sentence rather than a concept as Jill was emphasizing the importance of that. Um, that There are a number of traps uh, that people, your patients will come up with. And let me see if you can identify why these are traps. Uh, Sometimes patients will say, well, instead of trying to be perfect, I can tell myself that I'm just going to be, try to be the very best that I can. Can you see any problems with that? Because sometimes you jump out of the frying pan and into the fire. Right. What's, can anyone see a problem with that belief? It's still perfectionistic. Yeah. Okay. They seem like parallel statements. It, and it's what? They seem like parallel statements. That's, that's a great point. Any other weakness you can see with that statement? Well, let me ask you a question. How many times in your life can you be... Can you do the best you can do? You do your one time. And will you know that when that one time is when you're alive? No. <laughs> so, so if you have that, you're just, you're never going to know. It's just another version of perfectionism. As Diane said, you're never going to know when you're doing the best you can. But, you know, I'm, if I'm aiming to, 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 to be a great group, you're just going to be turned off by me. But if I'm loving you and sharing some things and we're being human and kind of learning together in an average way, you're probably going to give the group a wonderful rating, particularly if you're treated with warmth and respect and uh, and allowed to be vulnerable and human. But trying to impress you with some uh, fancy teaching techniques, if I was trying to do that, I'd be in a constant state of agony. I mean, I, I don't see how you could be a better teacher than Jill. I'll just be proud of Jill and try to love all of you and share what I have to share. And it's a, to me, it's like a miracle that turns out to be, you know, more than enough for joy and for learning. Uh, but I'm just, uh, that's so kind of you, David, but, and you know, David, um, that I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not that perfectionist. I mean, you and I have talked about this before, but it's a lot of fun uh, when you can leave your ego at the door and when yeah. you can try and work hard and try and do good things, but also feel pretty unattached to them, you know, things being fantastic. It's, yeah. It's pretty liberating. Yeah. All right. Now, next week, we're going to continue. We'll be starting out with the example of a time you felt upset due to your perfectionism. What were your negative thoughts? What were your feelings? So if you brought that in, something like that, we'd have some nice specific material. We're definitely going to do the experimental technique. Uh, that That's uh, examine the evidence because it's not to your advantage to be perfectionistic, but 
you know, is it true that your worthwhileness is not determined by your achievements? What's the truth of the situation? Is it true that, you know, people are going to be loving you more if you're trying to impress them, if you're try trying to be perfect? And then uh, the feared fantasy will also do that. That's a killer technique for any, almost any self-defeating belief, including perfectionism. And that's a way of just really grinding that, that, perfectionism to death and just shredding it completely uh, we all have a great week and uh, hopefully we'll have another really fun evening next week we love you too thank okay. you love you too yeah. bye this has been another episode of the feeling good podcast for more information visit dr burns website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.